You're listening to Lost in History with Scott Miller. In the autumn of 1887, a 23-year-old young lady who was dressed in rags checked into the Temporary Home for Women, a popular working-class boarding house on 2nd Avenue in New York City. There, she greeted the other tenants with incoherent conversation and a glassy-eyed stare. The first night, a fellow lodger said, I'm afraid to stay with such a crazy being in the house. Another predicted she will murder us before morning. The next day, police took her to Judge Patrick Duffy's courtroom, where he ordered that she be transferred to the Women's Lunatic Asylum on what is now Roosevelt Island. Hiding her face behind a handkerchief, the woman laughed with delight. She was faking the whole thing. Nellie Bly was on her first assignment for Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper, The New York World, attempting to expose the notoriously horrid conditions in the state's mental institutions by experiencing them firsthand. And if she could thrust herself to the center of the story in the process, all the better. I'm Scott Miller, and welcome to Lost in History. As listeners of this podcast know by now, I'm telling the stories of people you may not have heard of, but who still shape the world. To be honest, Nellie Bly might be too well known for the format of this series. I suspect many of you may have heard of her name before, but as a former journalist, I had to include her story. I came across Nellie Bly while writing my first book, The President and the Assassin, McKinley, Terror, and Empire at the Dawn of the American Century. By the time McKinley was murdered in 1901, she was one of the most famous journalists in America. What makes Bly interesting, though, is her pioneering roles as a feminist and a journalist. First, through grit and determination, she showed that women could succeed in a male-dominated occupation. Second, though some of her methods may be frowned on today, she helped revolutionize how the media covers news in this country. Conceiving a role for reporters as investigators, she helped birth the idea that journalists could and should expose society's evils. Nellie Bly was born Elizabeth Jane Cochran in May 1864 in a small town about 30 miles northeast of Pittsburgh. A skinny brunette who favored the nickname Pink and loved to wear clothes in that color, Cochran grew up in a close-knit and prosperous family. Too full of energy to study, she never really focused on her schoolwork and would be remembered as a rather wild student. Everything about Cochrane's young life was turned upside down when she was six years old. That was when her father died without leaving a will, an oversight that cost his family much of their life savings. Tight budgets forced her to drop out of school and help her mother run a boarding house. As Cochrane approached adulthood, her prospects of making anything of herself were dim. Always an avid newspaper reader, Cochrane noticed a series of editorials by Erasmus Wilson of the Pittsburgh Dispatch titled, What Girls Are Good For. A popular columnist, Wilson urged women to be happy performing chores such as cleaning and cooking. Such chauvinism enraged Cochrane, who penned a scathing reply under the name Lonely Orphan Girl. Somehow, Cochrane's letter managed to make its way to the paper's managing editor, George Madden. Her writing was clumsy and filled with grammatical errors. But he was impressed by her undeniable passion and called her in for a job interview. She arrived breathless from climbing the four flights of stairs to his office, and Madden initially described her as a shy little girl. But she got the job. Cochrane's early stories focused largely on women's issues, but she was hardly an equal rights champion. In a series called Our Workshop Girls, Women's Labor in Pittsburgh, Cochrane chose not to report on what were generally regarded as brutal working conditions for women. Instead, she extolled the caring foremen in factories that employed women and noted the well-supplied bathrooms. When she wrote an article about conditions at the McKinney Manufacturing Company, which made hinges, she described the practice of employing small girls as favors of kindness and charity to desperate families who needed every cent their daughters could earn. She even challenged the leaders of the women's movement, suggesting they work more and talk less. Putting young girls in upwardly mobile positions would accomplish more than years of talking, she wrote. With a bright personality and a gift for quick repartee, Cochrane got along well with her male colleagues and editors. 
But to make it as a reporter, she needed one more thing, a memorable byline. Without consulting her, Madden barged into the newsroom one day to solicit ideas for something neat and catchy. Several of the men suggested Nellie Bly, a name made famous 30 years earlier in a song penned by Pittsburgh's very own Stephen Collins Foster. With that, one of the most famous bylines in American journalism was born. Though she had come a long way in a remarkably brief amount of time, the newly minted Nellie Bly rapidly grew frustrated with writing stories that male editors assumed would interest female readers. She never had a shot at the hard news. All the best stories went to the men. As Bly considered ways to win her boss's respect, she decided to reach for the most rigorous and tough job in journalism, being a foreign correspondent. At age 21, Bly had never been out of the country. In fact, she had never really traveled far from home in Pennsylvania, and she certainly didn't speak a foreign language. But what Bly lacked in qualification and experience, she made up for in gumption and adventurous spirit, and left for Mexico to make a name for herself. When Wilson at the dispatch tried to dissuade her from going, Bly replied that she had to do something that no other girl had done before. Mexico turned out to be a disappointing experience. Far from blazing a trail for women, Bly found six other female correspondents already in Mexico City. Knowing little of the country and unable to speak the language, her stories were predictably superficial. She encouraged readers back in Pittsburgh to hire Mexicans as maids and domestic servants. And in another piece, she noted how women tortilla makers spit on their hands to keep the dough from sticking, hardly prize-winning journalism. After only four months, two months sooner than planned, she returned home, telling her editors that she hadn't been able to write harder-hitting pieces because the government might have arrested her. It was a fair point. The Mexican government was notoriously thin-skinned about criticism, but Ply's editors were still unimpressed and she was soon back reporting soft features. Finally, by March 1887, Bly could take it no longer. One day, she simply didn't show up for work. On her desk, she left a simple note that read, Look out for me. In the late spring of 1887, Bly went door to door among New York's great newspapers seeking work. The Sun, the World, the Herald Tribune, and the Times but her reporting in Pittsburgh was too provincial and too lightweight to interest the brass-knuckled editors of Gotham City, who rejected her at every turn. Though virtually broke, Bly refused to be defeated. As she later wrote, energy rightly applied and directed will accomplish anything. Late in the summer, she arrived at the headquarters of her favorite paper, Joseph Pulitzer's New York World and informed guards, secretaries, and anybody else who stood in her way that she had a blockbuster story. And if they wouldn't listen, she threatened, she would take her idea to the world's rival newspapers. Soon she had a meeting with managing editor John Cockerell. He had used sensationalist articles and reporting on scandal to guide the paper from a meager circulation to one of the most successful in America. To Cockerell, Bly now outlined an ambitious scheme to travel to Europe and return in steerage class to write an article about what it was like to immigrate to America. Cockerell thought the idea too ambitious for a rookie, but he liked her pluck and considered a new target. For months, Cockerell explained, New York newspapers had been writing about horrible conditions at the Women's Lunatic Asylum on what was then called Blackwell's Island in the East River. They agreed that Bly would go undercover and experience firsthand what exactly was going on there. The first hurdle was simply getting admitted to the institution. Trained doctors examined every patient. To fool them, Bly spent hours practicing in front of a mirror. She wandered the streets of Manhattan, perfecting a day's stare. And to complete her ruse, she assembled an outfit of tattered old clothes. An equally critical step, of course, was to secure a way out of the asylum when she was done with her reporting. To ensure that she would not be stuck there, Bly visited Assistant District Attorney Henry McDonough and explained her mission. He wasn't thrilled to be party to her dishonesty and worried about her safety, but she was so insistent on going undercover that he finally agreed to her plan. Thus prepared, Bly entered the hospital in late September 1887 and discovered that her long hours of practice at feigning mental illness had been well spent. 
One doctor declared her positively demented. Another diagnosed her as undoubtedly insane. So complete was her deception that New York City newspapers began to write articles about the pretty young lunatic. The Sun ran a story on the front page on September 25th asking, Who was this insane girl? The New York Times wrote of the mysterious waif with the wild, haunted look in her eyes. Inside the asylum, Bly discovered conditions were as bad as she had heard. The rotten food, the rats, the beatings, and above all, the torture in the guise of treatments. In one such practice, patients were forced to sit on a straight back chair from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. and were not allowed to talk or move. Bitter cold baths were among the worst. As she later wrote, my teeth chattered and my limbs were goose fleshed and blue with cold. Suddenly I got, one after the other, three buckets of water over my head, ice cold water too, in my eyes, in my ears, my nose, and my mouth. Anybody who wasn't already insane when they entered the asylum, she argued, surely would be after a couple of months. In just 10 days, she'd gathered plenty of material. The world sent its attorney, Peter Hendricks, to break the news of Nellie's undercover mission to the hospital staff. Rival editors were flabbergasted that a reporter had duped the experts. The Sun led its front page with the headline, Nellie Bly, too sharp for island doctors. Pulitzer was thrilled and said that Nellie had a great future before her. In addition to the front page coverage of her coup, she quickly published her dispatches in a slim but historically important book, 10 Days in a Madhouse. Most importantly, her reporting forced the city to confront the deplorable conditions at the asylum. In October, citing Bly's piece, New York Mayor Abraham Hewitt recommended increasing the budget of the Department of Public Charities and Corrections to over $2.5 million, up over a million dollars from the year before. In the end, the city settled for slightly less, but some fifty to $60,000 was earmarked for the Women's Lunatic Asylum to construct a new building, a new bathroom, and new oven for the kitchen. What's more, nurses and doctors began treating the patients with greater humanity. The world, of course, made sure it got all the credit. Their headline, The World Their Savior, How Nellie Bly's World Helped the City's Insane. In a single story, Bly had launched herself from provincial reporter in Pittsburgh to the queen of American media. In the months that followed, Bly continued her clandestine reporting. She posed as a maid to investigate conditions of employment agencies. She claimed to be an unwed mother for a story about trafficking of newborns. She even got herself arrested for grand larceny to see how male police officers treated her. She was sure one watched her as she undressed, and another made a pass at her. Publications around town began to write about Bly. Though some still found fault with her clumsy wordsmithing, all were filled with admiration at her dogged determination. A newspaper called The Journalist said of Bly, if there is a better newspaper woman on the face of the earth, we do not know her habitation. To the Epoch magazine, she was quite pretty and gifted with an indomitable pluck and nerve. With all her success, it was inevitable that others would imitate Bly's techniques. Soon a group of women that would somewhat patronizingly be known as the Stunt Girls was born. Winfried Bonfils, to name one, followed Bly's playbook to the letter. To expose how the poor were treated in San Francisco hospitals, Bonfils dressed in rags and pretended to faint on a city street. Taken to the city medical center, she experienced firsthand how poorly the staff treated the poor and wrote an article so scathing that hospital staff were fired. As author Brooke Kruger put it, the stunt girls, with Bly as their genre's leader, form the human chute down which the next generation of woman reporters plunged into journalism's mainstream. While Bly had been growing ever more famous, things had not been going as well for her paper, The New York World. In 1888, its editors watched in dismay as their circulation declined. The best, fastest way to arrest their sagging fortunes, they decided, was to engineer some sort of spectacular feat and then cover it with sensational reporting. Who exactly conceived of the plan is still a matter of debate. Bly claimed it was her idea, but the paper decided to send its star female reporter on an around-the-world trip 
in attempt to break the fictitious record of Phineas Fogg, the principal character in Jules Verne's novel Around the World in 80 Days. Bly since the trip offered a compelling opportunity to break down stereotypes of women. She announced that she would not be taking large steamer trunks filled with clothes. Instead, she would travel with a single small bag measuring only 7 inches by 16 inches. She would, in fact, spend much of the trip dressed in the same blue, broadcloth travel gown. With all the fanfare that the world's publicity department could muster, Bly left New York on November 14, 1889, at exactly 9.40, bound for London. After a brief stop in the British capital, she made directly for her first major news event of the journey, a visit to the home of Jules Verne in France. The famed author was smitten. Bly was, he said, the prettiest young girl imaginable, and what took the hearts of myself and Madame Verne was the complete modesty of the young person. And he had another reason to be happy. Interest in her trip prompted his publisher to issue ten new editions of his book. As Bly continued her journey, a sick realization swept over the world's editors in New York. Their correspondent would have next to no time to prepare articles for them, much less find anything insightful to say about sites that whizzed past. So to maintain interest in Bly's adventure, the world began employing experts to describe places and sites that she probably would be seeing. And to make sure that people kept talking about the race, the paper launched a contest asking readers to guess Bly's final finishing time. They received more than 100,000 ballots. There had also been an unexpected development that helped keep Bly's trip a public fascination. When the editors of Cosmopolitan Magazine learned about the race, they decided to enter their own real-life competitor, and a fellow woman reporter at that, Elizabeth Bislin. Normally an editor of the magazine's literary section, Bislin said she was practically stupefied with astonishment when her bosses asked her to make the trip. But within only a few hours, she agreed, and soon began her race going westward, the opposite way around as Bly. Unaware that she now faced a flesh-and-blood competitor, Bly made her way from Egypt to the Indian Ocean. Reaching Colombo in what is now Sri Lanka, Bly discovered a little spare time to do some exploring when her outward transport was delayed for several days. Nervously passing time, she took in the sights and observed fellow tourists. Those from Britain especially annoyed her because of their habit of singing God Save the Queen at every opportunity. Finally able to move on, Bly traveled to Penang and to Singapore where she acquired a traveling companion a monkey she named McGinty. By the time she landed in Hong Kong, Bly had more than made up lost time in Colombo and was now actually ahead of schedule. But dreadful news awaited. There, for the first time, she learned about her arrival from Cosmopolitan magazine. And what was worse was that a ticket salesman at the Oriental and Occidental Steamship Company told Bly that Bislin would probably beat her to New York. Resuming her journey, Bly encountered one obstacle after another. A Pacific storm slowed her ship's passage, driving her to despair. If I fail, she vowed, I will never return to New York. I would rather go in dead and successful than alive and behind time. And when her ship, the Oceanic, arrived in San Francisco the morning of January 20th, there was a period of panic when the purser screamed that her bill of health, needed for any passenger to disembark, had been left behind in Yokohama. Bly briefly threatened to slit her throat if she couldn't get off, but the documents were quickly found. And no sooner did Bly set foot on the United States that she learned that rail lines headed east had been paralyzed by one of the worst snowstorms in a decade. Snowflakes, it was said, were the size of soda crackers. The world, in fact, was so nervous that it arranged a special train that would take Bly on a southerly but more time-consuming route to avoid weather delays. But at least good news awaited her about Bisland. Bly's American rival had indeed made excellent time, but disaster struck in Europe when she became confused about an onward connection and was forced to take a slow-moving passenger liner. She could not possibly catch up. Bly sped across the U.S., waving and smiling at people who lined the track to see her pass. She worked on stories about her trip and held court for reporters who joined her for short stints of the journey. She told one reporter, 
there really is not much for Americans to see in foreign lands. We've got the best of everything here. We lack in nothing. Then when you go over there, you must get robbed, you get nothing fit to eat, and you see nothing that Americans cannot improve upon wonderfully. When Bly's train pulled into New York, she was mobbed by 5,000 people. The clock stood at 72 days, 6 hours, 11 minutes, and 14 seconds, well ahead of Phineas Fogg's mythical 80 days. In 1895, five years after circling the globe, Bly married millionaire Robert Seaman and took a long break from journalism. They lived together for eight years until he died in 1903, leaving her in control of a massive manufacturing company. In business, her curiosity and independent spirit flourished. Bly went on to patent several inventions related to the oil industry, some of which are still used today. In her later years, Bly returned to journalism covering the women's suffrage movement and World War I. She died of pneumonia on January 27, 1922. But a hundred years later, her legacy lives as the woman who reinvented journalism in America. I hope you enjoyed this week's show. If you have any questions or feedback, reach out to me on Twitter at S underscore Miller underscore books. And be sure to check out my website, www.scamillerauthor.com. We'll see you next week.